Welcome everybody to the Banyan Books podcast. Today we are in conversation with Dr. Martin Shaw. My name is Ross McKeechee. Before we get into Dr. Shaw's formal introduction, I just want to let everybody know that although we have people joining from all around the world, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Now, Banyan Books is celebrating its 50th year as Canada's spiritual and healing resource, an independent bookstore uh, with the same ownership from start until present day, located at uh, 4th and Dunbar in Vancouver's Kitsilano. So just letting everybody know, please support local independent bookstores. Every time you buy a book from Banyan, you support all kinds of wonderful free programming like this event today. You can go to our website, www.banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com if you wanna purchase books, or you can go in to store in person anytime. We're open every day of the week, seven days a week. Now our guest today, Dr. Martin Shaw, he's widely regarded as one of the most exciting teachers of the mythic imagination. He founded the Oral Tradition and Mythic Life courses at Stanford University and is director of the West Country School of Myth in the UK. Dr. Shaw has introduced thousands of people to mythology and how it penetrates modern life and for 20 years has been a wilderness rites of passage guide, working with at-risk youth, those who are unwell, returning veterans, as well as many women and men seeking a deeper life. His essay in conversation with Ai Weiwei on myth and migration was released by the Marciano Arts Foundation. And our guest is author of the award-winning Myth Teller trilogy, including A Branch from the Lightning Tree, Snowy Tower, and Scatterlings. His most recent books include, and there are quite a few, The Night Wages, Cinderbiter, Wolf Milk, Courting the Wild Twin, all Those Barbarians, Wolferland, and his Lorca translations, Courting the Dawn with Stephen Harding. Today, Dr. Shaw is with us in conversation about his newest book titled Smoke Hole, Looking to the Wild in the Time of the Spyglass. Smoke Hole is a passionate call to arms and an invitation to use these stories to face the complexities of contemporary life from fake news, parenthood, climate crises, addictive technology, and more. Martin asks that we journey together and let these stories be our allies, that we breathe deeper, feel steadier, and become acquainted with rapture. He writes, it is not good to be walking through these times with a, without a story or three by your side. Banyan Books community, please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin Shaw. Thanks for joining us today, Martin. Thank you, Ross. Now, we're picking up kind of where we left off in our last conversation. It's almost like a perfect continuation. And I'll encourage everybody to watch. Uh, if you're looking for our last conversation, it was back in March 2020 when the lockdown was first happening. Um, and you were just completing um, your quarantine at your cottage there so you could go back and see your daughter. And you had recently written an essay titled, same as this book, Smoke Hole, which we read out in that, in that conversation. Now, I'm wondering if you can fill us in what's happened from that time to the writing of this book to where we are now. Certainly. Hello, folks. Uh, so yeah, I think, Ross, that actually the last time we spoke was, was probably the first time I'd ever had a Zoom experience. Like everyone else, I've now had about 10,000 of them, so I'm a little bit more savvy. But yes, I was alone in the cottage, as I have been for an enormous amount of the last year, waiting till I could see my daughter again. I'm pleased to say that we were reunited and all is well. Um, and in England, for sure, there were periods where we were able to get out and about a little bit, but an enormous amount of the last year has been under 
one form of lockdown or another. Now, one of the things that I had petitioned for at the beginning of this experience was to pursue it possibly more as an experience of solitude than isolation. Language gives away a lot about our kind of collective anxiety, you know, living with uncertainty as opposed to the, you know, um, what would I think of it is, what would I think of living with uncertainty? I'd call it um, negotiating the mysteries. Very different, very different. So I was determined not to slip into my form of bad language as I went into this journey into the deep interior. Now, I have to be honest, I think at the end of last Christmas, as we went into the new year, I really started to grind my teeth a little and I was finding it difficult for all the reasons that we all do. Um, and I realized at that point, I probably had ruminated on enough to have something to write or communicate about this experience we're all in. I didn't want to hurry it. I didn't want to speak prematurely. I didn't want to create a mission statement or a pamphlet or, or be filled with certainty when actually the reality is none of us knew what was happening at that moment. So I wanted to stay true to the invitation, terrifying though it was. Now, in one of the brief moments where we did get out and about, I led a four day and night wilderness vigil in the forest nearby where I live, because of course you can't get better social distancing than that. And it was whilst we were round the fire and actually, as I was watching the smoke curl up from the fire, I began to have a few thoughts about what eventually became the book you've mentioned, Smoke Hole. And astonishingly, really, in the four days and nights they were out, the majority of the book I wrote in and around the fire. I have a little journal. I have a pen. I write in the way that we have for many, many years. And then after a while, I was able to scrabble to something and begin to type it up. And funnily enough, similarly, in tone and delivery and urgency to Courting the Wild Twin, the book almost wrote itself. And the thing that was going on in my head at that time, when I was up there with the vigilers, we'd been working with a story called The Handless Maiden. Now, this is a young woman who, through a degraded betrayal by her own father, loses her hands and has to go far out into the world through many travails to eventually grow them back. Now, over in England, at least, one of the mandates of lockdown had been don't touch anything. Whatever you do, don't touch anything. And if you do, you better wash your hands quick. So as slowly, incrementally, we began to move through this experience and hopefully into a deeper life, one of my questions has been, how are we as cultures going to grow our own hands back? This is a story I think that we can work with in this way. How do we grow our own hands back? Then the second part of the book was very different. It's a, it's a section called Breaking Enchantments, because one of the things I realized after eight or nine months, primarily on my own in the cottage, was that I was putting myself into mild trance states most of the time, because I wasn't around other people, other conversations, to break up the uh, hallucinatory quality of my thoughts at that point. So the second part of the book, We've gone from growing your hands back to breaking enchantments. In other words, how do we learn to trust dialogue with our own soul if it feels that we are so depleted, we're actually getting fake news from our own psyche? What do we do with that? And I then found another story that I told for years on and off called The Bewitched Princess. It's not a story many people know. And then... 
quite magically into this arrangement the very week that I was up in the forest I came across a story from the Caucasus the Caucasus is a little region these days they call it Russia but it was the Caucasus has traditions and a very noble mythology attached to it called the Nart Sagas it's between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea I came across a story called the Spyglass and that without giving too much of a plot spoiler speaks directly to our relationship to social media now of course so many of us have spent an inordinate amount of on time online in the last 18 months and there came a point where I just found this really troubling uh, and the question really at the end of the book is not that we should you know smash and abandon all technology I don't believe that I'm not a Luddite but my question was when did a tool become a deity when did a tool become a deity you know I have a, a young daughter and she has something in her pocket with all the angels you could imagine in it and all the devils too uh, when I was her age all I wanted to do was to go to New York and visit the bars that Dylan Thomas drank in or I wanted to get on a white horse and and you know follow follow the road of Jack Kerouac or something like that but amongst a lot of younger folks that I meet, the world that they're most absorbed by is not America or Transylvania. Uh, it's, it's the virtual one. And again, this isn't me tutting and saying this is all a travesty. My question is, how do we negotiate this elegantly and with depth? So in other words, smoke hole in a long answer wrote itself through those kinds of questions. Thank you. Now, one of the things, and, and I remember this, the first time you and I met, I don't know if you recall, was when I was still working in the shop at Banyan and you were one of the first guests I hosted in store and you, you came and you told us a story and you told us how to listen to the story and how to apply the right questions and thinking to that story. I'm wondering if you can share with our, our live audience here today, our listeners, how do we approach these stories? What's the right way to approach these old stories? Great question. I think the first thing we could do is not tell the story what it is. Not tell the story what it is. Stories worth their salt, the ones that we come back to over and over again, are more than just an ornamental allegory they're more than just a political point they are alive in the way that they are we're very interested many people in an animistic universe well stories are as animistic as anything else is so I think the first thing that we do with a story is to bear witness to it so that when someone tells it to us there is, in a way, a sense that the story is being told for the first time ever in the shape that it is, providing it's not a recital. If the words are finding themselves in the imagination of the teller at that moment, something extraordinary is happening. And you may recall what I would ask the participants. I'd say, where do you find yourself in the story? That is not the same as saying, what the story means is this. That is, that is like shooting an eagle out of the sky. It is a neutering, castrating, bullying, foolish and naive thing to do. The story is speaking directly through images to the 30 or 200 or 2000 people that are there in very unique manner. So for me to say it means this, is to flatten out all the different nuances and dialogues that are going on in the participant's heart. So the best description of that for your audience is this. Think of it like acupuncture. And as the story is moving around your body and putting these little needles in, and for someone, all, all the heat is here in the shoulder. But for someone else, it's all about the kidneys. For someone else, it's all about the liver. And all I do 
is listen deeply in a diagnostic fashion to where in the room the story is landing. And in an almost divinatory sense, within an hour, by listening to where people locate themselves in this tale, it's almost as if I have a kind of x-ray of the room, of the spiritual conditions of the room. But I do it in a, I hope, a reflexive and soulful manner, rather, rather than stretching the story out to audition for the polemics of 2021. Thank you. In the book, early on, you, you mentioned, you talk about the importance of metaphor and image. Yeah. Um, and, and how it's really act very important to our sanity right now. And, and it, its presence in folk and fairy tales is very significant. And how can, how can the presence of metaphor in these old tales help us in the modern world? I think life, life falls apart rather quickly if you have no metaphorical sense of it. Now, I'm going to give a slight caveat when I mention the word metaphor. There's a danger with Western approaches to storytelling is that when you say it's all metaphor, in a sense, you reduce the images of their primal impact on you. It, 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 it can make them seem safer or smaller or easier to corral. That's not what I mean. But it, it, it matters to me that when we go through profound experiences of human beings, usually when we're tested, usually experiences of heartbreak or illness or profound uncertainty, there are images, we are, we are tuned in the caribou dust of our bones. We're absolutely tuned to thrive on stories and images, to chew on metaphors, because what they do is give meaning and sustenance to the seemingly arbitrary chaos of our own life. They have a kind of ordering principle to them. They, they give a little dignity. I remember the first time, I must have been 16 or 17, uh, when I first had my heart broken. And I remember it happened on the phone in a little call box in England. And I went home, and this was a catastrophic event, but no one had the language to give the seriousness of the event the weight it needed. So people said, well, you know, you'll get over it. It'll be all right. How bad can it be? I needed someone to say, tonight, all the crows landed on your roof. That was it. Just that, that little bit of beauty and sobriety and metaphor was needed for me to feel as I breathed, yes, something is acknowledging the spiritual weight of the walloping I've just gone through. So that's why I think metaphors matter. We've become very mechanical, haven't we? Yeah, I think we have. And I think especially in the last 18 months, we've been so stretched on the rack of statistics and, you know, uncertainty and worry um, for reasons that I think are not hard to understand. I don't think it's all sort of manipulation. I think they're very real, you know, very real concerns that we've been living through as cultures. But the soul, our sense of the marvelous, our sense of gratitude, um, all of that gets compromised when our adrenals are shattered. And we move just into a sort of survival speak. And Actually, when you go through something as immense as what we are going through, the only language that really does justice to it is what James Hillman used to say, has a poetic basis of mind. If you, this is, I'm, forgive me, I'm kind of mainlining Joseph Campbell at this moment, but I'll say it. If you have the facts of the matter, you have one thing. But if you have the story of the matter, it's entirely different. You know, people would say, um, what would they say about myth? You know, myths are a, a, 
a beautiful lie that tell a deeper truth, something like that. They never feel like lies to me. They feel like they are, an uner they are unearthing what the Mexicans call the river underneath the river. There's something going on in, here's a big word, the chthonic, in the subterranean. And what we need in a moment like this is deep sea divers. We need people that can dive into the condition of our times, come up without getting the bends and speak beautifully, honestly, and powerfully to others. So we start making myth from it. Last time we spoke, um you and I shared a couple of messages afterwards and you had, you had shared a post saying you thought maybe you'd said a little bit too much for where we were actually at on the cusp of this pandemic. And you said that the process that would help you to, to realize, Oh, we're at the threshold portion of the initiatory experience. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, the threshold, the return and this, this initiatory process, and then maybe comment on, a guess where we might be at now. Yes, of course. So what Ross is referring to, and some of you will know this very well, is within wilderness rites of passage and myths, I have to say from many parts of the world, there is an architecture to them. There is a rhythm to them that we see again and again and again. And this, has been studied by um, anthropologists like Arnold van Gennep and Victor Turner and others. It comes through the School of Lost Borders a lot in Britain. I'm sorry, not in Britain, in the States. Great Stephen Foster, Meredith Little, wave to everybody there. Um, so we see within myths and many initiations, three stages what they call severance threshold return. There are other phrases, but that's how I know it best. The severance is when you are usually fairly dramatically taken from the life that you were expecting and thrust into often fairly dramatic, startling trials. Now, in my work as a wilderness rites of passage guide, that part of the encounter, the threshold part, the dreaming part, the visioning part, the underworld part, usually takes place when you are out in the forest fasting on your own for four days and nights. But we, as a, we all have been in a kind of rather bizarre variant of that in our own little huts, homes, hotels, or wherever we've been quarantined, quarantined, our souls in some way are very ancient and they look around and they go, oh goody, something's happening at last. I'll send up strange divine messages and see if my friend, my body pays any attention to them. So that usually within a story, for example, if we were listening, if we were, if I was telling the Odyssey, this would be, the threshold period would be Odysseus trying to get back to Ithaca to be reunited with his wife. So in other words, it can last a long time. Then finally, you have what they call the return. Now the return is when in wilderness rites of passage speak, you return from the forest, fingers crossed with some sort of insight that the community in large find useful um now where are we in terms of that because we are in a much more porous situation than a traditional rite of passage uh there's no guarantee i would suggest that collectively we come out of this uh wiser some of us will some of us won't and I also think that any sense of let's get things back to normal or as they were misses the great soulful opportunities of what has actually been a very difficult experience. So where are we within that triad? It would be probably naive for me to say, certainly not out of the woods yet certainly not in a position where we can collectively start to make 
drastic statements, I would, th would think, but incrementally, bit by bit, person by person, certain profound insights and changes in lifestyle will appear. Here's something that you might find interesting, Ross, is that during this period, I barely told any stories. I was alone, you know, I wasn't in the mood for telling tales. And when I tried to tell stories again publicly, I found that the stories themselves had hurt feelings. They, they'd, they had fled over the hill of memory and disappeared. If you tell a story 100, 200, 500 times, it starts to follow a rhythm that is very faithful. In other words, it will get you from one end of the story to the other, and the images you're seeing as the teller don't change very much. It's a beautiful thing. But I found when I went back into this, none of that worked anymore. All the stories were malfunctioning, and I've had to do all the heavy lifting all over again. So I warn audiences now when they come and see me that don't expect a smooth ride because I'm in a process of reimagining my relationship, not just with the stories, but actually my own my friendship with the story all over again. So I'm seeing them in different ways. And one of the things I wanted to mention tonight to anybody listening is if I'm doing that in my own work life at the moment, that great moment of imagination where I'm revisioning these stories, what stories in our own lives that we are carrying are worth reimagining? What stories are you sick of? What stories have lost their roughage? Where, wh what in your life is going nowhere and you need it to quietly put it down? And what are the ones that need care, attention, and fidelity? One of my favorite words is fidelity. The reason I think that stories have been such great companions to me over the years is that I continually show up for them, whether I feel like it or not. The, the apple I feed, the pony of the story, is my fidelity. There, there's a metaphor for you. But when I stopped showing up, they started to doubt me. So I'm in a pr process of renegotiating that relationship, but I'm also looking at my wider life post at the moment, post lockdown, and I'm very open to certain parts of it staying moribund, not coming back. I'm very, I'm very open to what happens next. You said uh, early in the book, um... I am a teacher of old stories and a guide into deep places. In this life, it would appear I am to be wedded to the thinking of the wild. What do you mean by that statement, wedded to the thinking of the wild? The, as is, I probably, maybe we talked about this last time, I've spent an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time outdoors listening for someone that's well known as some as for someone that never stops talking, uh, I spend far, far more time listening. And I realized years ago through living in a tent for four years that the earth thinks in the way that it does, not like human beings think, but in the way that the earth does. And I realized that I had an almost divinatory ability to sense certain messages just by way, watching the ways that rooks, which is a, a bird, would move around a Norfolk field in the winter, or the way the salmon leapt in the river down on my beloved Dartmoor. In other words, it was communicating and talking to me. There was a kind of across species gossip going on. And the best of the stories you find, especially in indigenous cultures, woven into them are perspectives that are more than just human. They're not porcelain gods with the faces of humans. They're not the god of the river. They're river god. The river itself, 
the texture of the river, the smell of the river, the movement of the river is the expression of the deity in action. So that is all a form of thought to me. And ironically, just before lockdown began, I'd already spent 101 days vigiling in the forest as if I was a glutton for punishment because I didn't know this was going to happen. So I was already pretty tuned to what I call uh, the, the thinking of the wild. Yeah. You, you talk about it in the book where during that 101 ceremony uh, vigil that you completed, you asked the woods this question, how do you want me to love you? Mm. Can you speak to the power of this kind of inquiry in, in any kind of relationship? I can. I can. And if I do that, I also want to mention the man who first named that. He's, he's an extraordinary writer and thinker called John Lee. And John Lee talked about that in terms of human relationships, men and women, women you know, whatever relationships you have. The question would be, rather than coming in to a new relationship to someone you don't know very well, and attempting to love them with all the kind of signals and gusto that you expect, how would it be if you just sat down and had a conversation and said, my first act of love to you is to ask you, how do you want me to love you? How is it? You don't, and you don't have to agree with everything they say, but you have to be available to listen and digest. So the important thing for me about the vigil in the forest was that I was not in any kind of devouring mode. I wasn't there to become wiser. I wasn't there to use nature as a backdrop while I processed something in my own life. I was there as a messenger of that place if it wanted to use me. And as I circle back to that word, I keep using fidelity. I was going to deliver fidelity to this place because I was going to come not just when I felt like it, not just when I felt uh, enthused or emotional. I was going to turn up whatever the weather and listen and listen and listen and listen. Uh, and of course, it led me into the most dramatic of circumstances, but uh, I didn't see that coming at the time. It's changed me that I'm profoundly changed by that time. Um, yeah, I was left with nine words, Ross, nine words for 101 days. That's what I was left with. And I'm not going to reveal them here, but it was worth it. It was worth it. That seems probably the appropriate kind of uh, work that we have to do. 101 days for nine words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask if you'd like to share um, an excerpt from the book. Sure. Um, while you do that, I'll just remind our live audience, uh, Dr. Shaw is going to be taking your questions for the last 15 minutes. So Feel free to go into the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen and type in any questions that you have for Dr. Martin Shaw, and we'll get to those in not too long. Okay. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. So this is, I'm going to read, I think, the, the letter that I wrote at the beginning of lockdown uh, that actually got it got it started the process of the book really and it it suggests that just underneath our knees we all have a prayer mat and rather than being filled with visions and envy of longing and longing for other cultures and people it might be an interesting practice just to pay attention to the ground that's directly underneath us so i'll read a bit about that Let's start by kneeling down, because the thing I'd love to talk about is beneath us. It's a prayer mat. We're all praying for something. I know there's a lot to hold our attention right now. Everywhere I glance, there's a screen pummeling us with statistics, but I'm going to ask us to lower our gaze for a moment 
you and I. Examine the weave of the mat, scrunch up your nose and rub up to the dizzy, strange scent of its perfume. There is no one size fits all mat. There are countless millions of prayer mats, every one different. There's just enough room for you to kneel on, and that's about it. Let's really look at the weave, because it's moving. There's a Norwegian tugboat pulling into Alexandria at midnight. There are pale stars over a Provencal castle. There's a desert woman weaving an emu feather into her hair. If we keep paying attention to this little strange stretch of rug, things happen. We start to witness a secret history of the earth. Not the only history, but one tributary of a bigger river that eventually leads us to the vast ocean of time and consequence. We behold this with our old mind, not our new mind. Sometimes I call this bone memory, not skin or flesh, but bone knowing. It's bone knowing that makes us storytellers. Keep looking. Behind even your people, there are sweeping cranes, misty Welsh hills, lush Ecuadorian valleys, and miles and miles of flowers. These are your ancestors too. I say it again, we make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. We make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. In a time when we are begging for a new story, it may be the stories we need are supporting us right now, if only we would lower our gaze. The stories we remember, the ones we sink our teeth into, that we never discard, disown or grow too old for, are ones that live in the tension of the timeless and the time bound. The stories that got us and our people here in the shape that we are, those are the time bound. But it's the smoke hole that brings in the timeless, the essential, the vital. And I'm petitioning that we could live between both. So that's first little reading. Thank you. Um, in the story, The Bewitched Princess, Yes, you're speaking, you're speaking of Peter, and there's a short quote I have, then a, a question. So you said, um, because of Peter's willingness to take on this task of carrying the dead, he has ensured that the corpse becomes not a ghost, but an ancestor. Now, my question around this is that the current time we're living in, not many folk have an understanding or awareness around the significance or importance of honoring the dead and acknowledging or giving gratitude to those that came before us. So I'm wondering if you can help us here to feel the significance of that. Yes. Um, I, I know many of us are living rather haunted lives. Haunted lives. Uh, some of us have become you know, ventriloquists for other people's ideas. We've become little more than holograms, some of us. But an ancestral connection is something where you have a root system that you are in touch with. An ancestral connection means that you're not floating slightly off the ground. You mentioned in the introduction an artist who I once wrote a book for, Ai Weiwei, or wrote a, an essay for, uh, and the first question he asked me when I walked into his studio is, do you have the bones of your dead with you? And he wasn't kidding. Uh, where, where are the bones of your dead? Where, where are your people buried? These things mattered to him. And I think that an ancestral connection um, is something that offers sustenance, as I said, a root system and means that we live lives of significance rather than just being ghosted from place to place or haunted from place to place. 
Now, Ross, for just for, I'm going to stop for a moment. Next door to me in my cottage, there's lots of men smoking cigars and drinking wine, and they're getting a bit noisy. So I'm just going to knock on the door. Well, he's doing that. Just a reminder, I see some questions are rolling in from everybody that's here live. So please keep them coming. We'll be getting to those in about five minutes. Martin, there's the, the theme around the internet, smartphones, social media, internet porn. You spoke to you know your daughter having this phone in her pocket. What are you seeing about these times that we're in that we need to stay really alert to as a culture? Well, it's 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 odd how seductive the peril the perilous is. It's a perilous moment, but it's also very seductive. The very technology that enables us to have this conversation right now uh, is connected to all the stuff that also can be terribly damaging. Here's a here's a thought though. In Greek mythology, the god Hermes, god of the storytellers is the being that communicates at lightning speed from person to person, deity to deity. Now, whilst that um, is so, the detail that people often forget about Hermes is that he communicates soul to soul. And if the soul is not roused, the message is not received. And so when people say to me, aren't you glad we're living in a Hermean age? I say, no, this isn't Hermean age, because it is very rarely the soul that is being communicated with through this type of technology. For me, it's often the loin or the mind. But this terrain around here, you know, where I'm gesturing towards the, the heart and I'm gesturing towards the soul, that is, that is, it, it is different. Um, the soul is prone to nostalgia and strange kind of missteps that it's asking you to pay attention to in your own life. It, uh, it values strange kind of inefficiencies. Where I live in Dartmoor, our houses are always falling down because they're so old and it requires the village to put them back together again, you know, who's, especially houses where the, the um, the roof is made out of hay. So this notion of self-sufficiency, for example, that we're all so addicted to is, it's not good village behavior in some way. We need, we need, we need to need each other. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. On this topic, uh, there's another quote. Um, you said, uh, and this is again in reference to the bewitched princess in every story in this book there's bad deals and possession states terribly contemporary what mm. stands behind beautiful people seducing you to answer to bewildering and impossible questions if you replace the mention of questions and replace it with standards then we catch a glimpse these berserk oligarchs of empty beauty who sit in their throne rooms of Instagram and TikTok, starving and disorienting their subjects with expectations that can barely be met. And like the bewitched princess, there's sometimes something older and savvier behind them pulling on the strings. Dare you tell us a bit about that something that's older and savvier behind them? We, we, you know, that would, that would require, you know, another three hours of serious conversation. And it would also, we would need to look at the reality of evil. Uh, and uh, that, that requires certain sort of parameters. I can go there. I can go there. Uh, so without being able to do that in the time that we had, um, Yes, in, in any, I don't want to generalize, but in many cultures worth their salt, there is the notion that there are energies in this world that do not wish us well. We can talk 
uh, and be advocates and we should of the business of love and kindness and decency and grace and we should attend to those things and that's what I try and do in my own life but that doesn't mean there's not wild difficult ingenious darker energies out there too uh, especially ones that can influence uh, the influence young younger people especially so what I was beginning to get at was that kind of thing really in the story you're describing there's a beautiful young woman who gives riddles but what's standing behind her supplying her with that information is not the beautiful young woman but an energy called the hostile mountain spirit that is not a good thing and uh, you'd have to read a bit more about the book to get a sense of that or, and this isn't a plug really, but you'd have to come to my school and study with me where I really open that door. Who wouldn't want to do that? I, I, I would love to come and do that someday. Oh, I hope you do. And I'll reiterate, this is a, a wonderful book, especially for this times. And I, I know I'm going to open it up regularly and refer to it. Okay, some questions from our live audience. The first one is from Chris, Christine, and Christine says, thanks so much to all involved. My question is, I'm in a big inner transition, initi initiation, or death, and I don't even know exactly what it's about, just that it's happening. Can you speak to helpful approaches in a situation like this? Just read, did you reread it to me, and then sure. I respond. She says, I'm in a big inner transition, initiation, death. And I don't, I don't even know exactly what it's about, just that it's happening. Can you speak to helpful approaches in a situation like this? What is the name of this? Is it a young woman? Christine, yeah. Well, well hello, Christine. Uh, bless your heart for asking the question. I don't, there are a few details about you I don't know, and we won't have time for that uh, at this second. Other than initiation always, an initiatory experience always has an element of death within it, and it has a bit of danger within it. However, an initiation in a traditional uh, culture that understood it would have people around usually older, that guarded the parameters of the encounter to make sure that you didn't literalize the whole thing, that it actually became an experience of losing your own life. That's where, of course, you know, symbols and rituals and what's that word we used, Ross, metaphors come in. I've worked a lot over the years with young people, often ironically at graduation, who at that very moment where theoretically they're opening up towards the world have been assailed with thoughts of suicide or ending their life. And an image I want to give you is of a Scandinavian image of something called a cinderbiter. And it's a period of time where a woman or a man lies by a fire, usually over the winter, and doesn't do very much. They just drift and dream and drift and dream and drift and dream. And from a distance, it looks like they may not even be alive anymore, but it's understood to have a sort of sacred integrity. They are in fact doing this business of biting the cinders, dreaming by the cinders, and actually, in those store, cinder biting stories, there comes a point where the thing that actually saves culture can only come from the cinder biter, not the queen, not the king, not the magician, not the farmer, the cinder biter. And one of the things I've worked a lot with, with younger folks especially, is if you don't know that a role like a cinder biter exists, it is just possible you could mistake the desire to lie down and deepen into this profound encounter with the movement from life into death itself. 
because our culture is seemingly not literate enough, literate enough to discern the difference. So whatever is going on for you, hang in there, take courage, and be a good cinder biter. You'll find it, I actually have a book called Cinder Biter, but if you go online, you'll probably, there's no doubt a recording of me somewhere telling it. Uh, and if you're in, if you need to talk more about this, send your email to Ross and he'll send it to me and I'll talk to you directly. Okay. Our email is events at banyan.com, events at banyan.com. So if that's an, a necessity, please send an email. Okay, we have a question from Andrew. Can stories be a precision technical instrument for learning about oneself and one's culture? I'm thinking of the oral storytelling tradition of Central Asia and of course, the Mula Nasruddin corpus. Thank you. Yes, absolutely they can. Um, they can be extremely precise uh, and they can, they, to be honest, if, if you don't have a culture which is using stories as the primary mode of instruction, I don't think you have a culture at all. You have a society and that's not the same, quite the same thing. So yes, um, depending on the discipline and the skill you want to develop, the stories could be, you know, as filigreed as a very sharp blade or as long and as wispy as a Devonian forest. Your art form and the skill you want to develop will be dictated by the stories that are given to you as instruction. That's all I can say. The next question is from Emily who asks, could you advise us on how not to betray dreams and other messages from the underworld in the telling of them. Yeah, a very simple thing is, do you remember I said earlier on, don't tell the story what it is, don't tell the dream what it is. And to honor, you know, one of my honorary ancestors, a man called James Hillman, James Hillman used a wonderful phrase, stick to the image when it comes to dreams. It's okay to tell your dreams, but as soon as you say that the black snake that appeared is actually your mother, the dream is over because you're now interpreting the dream. It, it doesn't make, you know, all these books where it's like, okay, okay, what does the snake symbolize? Oh, all, all my teeth disintegrated. It means I'm anxious. Of course it bloody means you're anxious. Any, anyone can see that, but dreams, and the portrayal of dreams is a wonderful question because it's very similar to everything I said earlier on about stories, fidelity, showing up, not telling the story what it is. Um, it's fine to speak of your dreams. Sto dreams have amazing, they are a personal mythology and they have pro prophetic energies in, providing you just don't, um, you don't analyze all the, all the nutrition out of it. So just don't tell the, I, I, when I have a powerful dream, I draw it rather than tell it. I draw it rather than write it down. Thank you. Randolph, Randolph asks, please add a little more context to your deeper meaning of the word fidelity and how one may apply that in life. Sure. Um, the, what, the reason I keep coming back to fidelity is I, so many of us are basically hardwired to do things as long as we feel like doing them. So in other words, if you're in a state of, you know, uh, rapture, you're going to keep turning up to the, you're going to keep turning up to a story or to a stretch of land because it's giving you something. Well, what happens when it goes silent? Are you going to keep turning up? The reason I went to the forest for 101 days was I knew there'd come a point where I would be desperate for this to finish and it was going to be a test to see if I had the stomach for it or not. Because I see this again and again, really. I have to say it's part of the spirit of our age. 
that we're we're wired to do things as long as we feel we're we're getting something from it. And the reason I think that I have some some success in the work that I do is not actually that I have excessive amounts of talent. I just have the stomach for it. I just have the stomach. You just keep turning up. You have to do this in relationships. You have to convince a story that you're serious. And the way you do that is you say, I will be here three days a week until you tell me you don't want me to be here anymore. You ask the story again, how do you want me to love you? What's the kind of libation you require? What is the kind of dialogue that we need to enter into? In other words, you get clear on what temple you are serving in. Without fidelity, we move endlessly from, plant, from flower to flower to flower to flower, taking the pollen from each, but never really deepening. And I tell you, that makes you a gigolo, but not a husband. And at almost 50, I'm, I'm more interested in husbandry. I'm, all, I'm much more interested in a kind of steadfastness. You know, the thing that's most alive for me at the moment is a kind of interior code of gallantry that I want to develop as I get older the, the, about, about modes of behavior. How do you want to behave? Do such things as good and evil exist? What are you going to stand for? And the really big question for me at this age is how how do you earn your name? When I was small, when I was a little boy, I thought about that all the time. How do I earn my name? And what does the name Martin Shaw mean? And at this age, when I say, how do you earn your name? It's nothing to do with worldly success. It's not to do with being famous. It's not to do with having a podcast. It's just being clear about what you love, what you defend, what you stand for. And for me, fidelity is a big part of that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is from Remick, who says, an indigenous elder said we are living between mythologies where the old one is dying and the new one is not written yet. How do we give rise to the new mythology or new collective story as a changing culture? Okay, that's a very interesting question. I've never see, heard it framed like that, but that's very good. I think there's a difference between a mythology and a story. We are story making beings. We will inevitably create stories about the moment that we're in. Whether or not we have the substance to create a mythology is different. The subject of a mythology traditionally should be a kind of a cross species gossip between us and the wider earth and contained within that mythology should be perspectives that are more than human. So if we are going to have a mythology of that, that quality and life energizing properties, we need to get out into the bush again. We need to get out into the wild places and we need to sit and sit and sit. But I don't think a mythology like that can be created by one person alone. It is a, it is a, a, a sort of a mass event and you can't find it, I'm afraid, hunched over your laptop in you know, London uh, or an urban environment. I, I work in urban, urban environments all of the time but my listening at this point is to the more than human. So anything, any emerging story worth its salt has to have more than the, the vanities and neurosis of humans in them. Thank you. I'd just like to, to finish by asking you uh, what's, what's next for you, what's happening? Are there any um, events or programs or things you'd like to let us know about? Sure, I would. Uh, I'm excited because next month uh, I have my, a new program called Stalking the Rebel Soul, 
uh, is about to start in Dartmoor, on Dartmoor in England, where I come from. We've got a few places left. If you go to schoolofmyth.com online, you'll find it immediately. It's a five weekend program where we go all the way really from prehistory through to the present day, looking at, I think I just, I read it earlier, a secret history of the earth. Uh, the earth through the tendrils of myth as we get from one end to the other. I also have a master's program called Poetics of Imagination uh, that runs at Dartington, uh, the Dartington Art School in Devon, where people come and work with me intensely for a year. And that leads to a traditional master's qualification at the end. So you can become, you know, an MA in mythology. Um, what else is going on? Of course, the wilderness rites of passage stuff is still, uh, we've got more folks wanting to do that than almost we know what to do with. In my own life, personally speaking, what's alive for me at the moment actually is not reheating the meal of my previous successes. Uh, I'm not, I'm very, I feel very open at this moment in my life to, and I'm, I'm 50 in October, so I'm right at the end of my 40s and I'm looking ahead uh, and maybe, maybe I'll do something entirely different, you know, maybe I'll just whittle sticks, I don't know. Uh, but I have a lot of concerns, or in, when I say concerns, I don't mean I'm concerned, I mean things I'm involved in that are just, you know, very quiet and private and I just look forward to developing them too. Wonderful to hear. Thank you. And I want to let everybody know, um, Jacob, our producer, who does such an amazing job organizing all of Banyan's events, all of these podcasts, he's always there on the back end coordinating things. He posted uh, in the chat and the Q&A tab um, that you can watch our previous conversation with myself and Dr. Martin Shaw on Banyan's YouTube channel. So if you search for Banyan Books and Sound on YouTube, or you can listen to the interview on our audio podcast, which you can find anywhere that podcasts are found. The title of that um, podcast was Dr. Martin Shaw, Pandemic and Mythic Meanings of This Cultural Moment. So it's a nice connective uh, interview with the one we've just done. Um, and thanks, Jacob, for reminding everybody about that. Thanks to everybody at Banyan Books. And of course, Dr. Martin Shaw, so much gratitude uh, that you took the time to join us today. Thank you, Ross, and uh, hello to everybody out there.